more or less on the doorstep of, Hanu of, uh, <laughs> of Rosh Hashanah. Very, very special time of the year, probably the most special time of the year, the head of the year. Rosh Hashanah. We know that everything depends on beginnings. If the, if the initial steps are good and the beginnings are powerful, everything will follow in step and be successful and good. Depends where the first step is headed, the direction. So obviously, everyone who came here tonight is making a very correct and proper step forward in the right direction, and this means a lot. It means we hope, as that Hashem, the whole year will be a year of of moving forward in the right direction and with continuity and with strength and conviction and to grow. That's what it's all about. There's a lot to be said about Rosh Hashanah and I'm sure everyone is aware of a lot of that. The point I would like to, uh, bear, to bear upon and discuss is the fact that on the first Rosh Hashanah Adam Rishon was created, Adam was created on the first Rosh Hashanah. And that has great significance. Because man is the, cent is the most important and central point of creation. The ultimate purpose of creation was the creation of man. Everything else is there for scenery. Scenery to make it a nice, attractive world. We have, you know, beautiful, many countries and seas and rivers and valleys and mountains and trees and forests and, and animals, millions of species, birds, fish. Hashem made it a very beautiful world for man to live in. But as it says in the Torah, everything was created for man. Not only man was the peak of creation, but really, and this is a very deep concept, which should make us feel a lot of responsibility, man was given control of, of the whole of creation. We can develop and build the world, and the physical world and the highest spiritual worlds, or we can destroy them. Our actions are so powerful, it's like we have uh, what we call shlat, shlat rahok, how we say in English. Uh, Remote control. We, we have the buttons to press. And to what extent do we press these buttons? That we can cause anything that happens in the world, for good or for bad, which puts a very heavy responsibility on us to do the right things. We all wish well to every Jew, but we know that Jews suffering. And many of the Jews who are suffering, we don't even know them. They could be living at the far corners of the world. But we're connected, as the rabbis say, Israel arivim zelazeh. Israel are responsible for one another. The biggest mistake of, uh, of, uh, of Cain and Havel, Cain's mistake, when he killed his brother, and Hashem asked him, where's your brother? He said, Hashomer achi anuchi. I am responsible for him. So that's the biggest mistake. When a person doesn't realize, yes, we are responsible. What happens to any Jew in the four corners of the world, it could be that we could have been uh, the cause of his suffering or the cause of his success. Just to make it a little more practically understood. The Gemara says that one should always regard the world in the, in the scales, balance scales. And the scales are equal to the right, which is good, and to the left, which is not good. They're balanced. If a person does one good deed, he tilts the right side of the scales and he brings blessing and success and happiness to all the Jewish people. Some people need to find their spouses, others need to be successful in make, earning a living, others need to have health issues, they need to have cures and, and all sorts of things. Everyone has needs. If we tilt the scales in the right way, it will be a very successful year for all of Am Israel. But if, God forbid, a, a one person, one Jew, doing one sin, 
when the scales are balanced, he tilts them the other way, and then what's going to happen? It'll be very negative for every Jewish person. So we have to realize this responsibility. Man has freedom of choice. He is the only created being who has given freedom of choice. Even angels don't have freedom of choice. That's why the Pasuk says, the verse says concerning man, I have given you ways to ascend or to go down among these static beings. Angels are static beings. They can't go up on their own, they can't go down on their own. Their functioning, their functioning depends on us. We give them the power to ascend or come down. As, it's, as it says concerning Yaakov Avinu, Yaakov Avinu had a dream. He fell asleep on the Temple Mount, on the place which eventually would be the Holy of Holies, upon the rock of uh, Shtia, which was the, the starting point of, the cre of creation. He fell asleep. And Hashem showed him a dream, a vision. He saw a ladder going up. The ladder, its feet were on the ground, but the head of the ladder went up and up and up. And he saw angels ascending on the ladder and coming down on the ladder. So what is this ladder? The answer, the, the answer is this ladder is the Jewish soul. True, physically, man was created from the dust of the earth. Hashem collected earth, mixed some water with it, and made like a clay and made it into a form of a human being. And it was a chunk of mud with, with a form, a human form. But then it says, Hashem blew into his nostrils the spirit of life. And this spirit of life is in essence what we call the Jewish soul. So through Hashem's blowing into this chunk of mud with the human form, the spirit of life, man was given, it's, it's almost forbidden to say, excuse me that I'm saying it, a divine soul. As the rabbis say, man de na, the Zohar says it, man de nafah mi nafah. when you blow, you blow from within yourself. So if Hashem blew, where did he blow from? from within himself, and his essence is divinity. He is the ultimate spiritual being, being, with no limitations of power, space, or time. And he blew in from his spirit, the spirit of life, into man, and man came alive. So now man has literally two extremes. On one hand, He's physical, from the dust of the earth. On the other hand, he's spiritual. His, his soul is a spark of divinity. Obviously, his spiritual side wants to soar upwards and cleave to Hashem. And the physical side comes from the dust of the earth, wants to enjoy life physically. There's a lot to do. We have beautiful beaches and sun. You can you know, uh, swim in the sea and, and lie on the beach, the beach and get suntan and enjoy all the comforts of life, have uh, all sorts of pleasant relationships and enjoy the physical life. But when that happens, really, you're giving vent to all your physical necess necessities, more or less like hippo hippopotamus or an alligator. They also love the water, they jump in, they plunge into the water, they wag their tails, then they come onto the dry land and they lay over backwards or frontwards and enjoy the sun. They, you know, you pat a horse, he's, he's in ecstasy. Wow. A dog, same thing. So people enjoy what's physical. Physically, we enjoy what's physical, but then there's nothing to differentiate between a human being and, uh, and any other created animal. And of course, man was created with two very, very, very highly developed uh, entities. Number one, a human brain. 
All the animals cannot communicate. Yeah, if there's a fire and uh, so if they probably have some sort of a shout, a bark, which warns and they run, they can, that type of thing. Or if they're hungry, they can make sounds which people know, oh, he's hungry. Things like that, okay. But to communicate, you're never going to see a dog giving a shiur, you know, a lecture in a university and telling all the other dogs about some very highly developed scientific uh, uh, equations, maybe Einstein's theory of uh, relativity or some great uh, mathematical or physical or in physics or in scientific theory. No, they have no way of communicating ideas. Man has a brain and the power of speech and communicate ideas, can communicate ideas. That's why our rabbis tell us that there are four levels of creation. Domem, tzomea, hai, midaber. Domem, rocks, earth, anything which has, which doesn't even move. It's static, completely static. It's like a rock. The rock on its own can't jump, can't run, can't do anything. It doesn't even grow. What it is, it is. Okay, that's domem. It's like a dead chunk of, of stone or whatever. Tzomea, plants, can grow. They have a high level where they can grow. You plant the seeds and slowly it sprouts. It'll become, you know, a bush. Then it'll go into a tree. Then it'll yield fruit. It can grow. So that's called tzomea. It grows. Then you have animals which are, call, are called hai. Domain tzomea, hai. They are living entities. And, uh, plants are not living in essence. They grow, but they don't live. Whereas uh, any animal, even birds, fish. But chai is also made of it because the chai is speaking. Okay, I mean, maybe you know how to. Can you talk to, can you discuss with the dog sign? Okay, sign? Tuki. Excuse me, then you're also. also. You're talking like a tuki. I don't want to insult you. <laughs> Let me explain why. I'll explain why. Because the tuki, yeah, he doesn't know what you're saying. When you tell him, boo, and he'll say, boo, he doesn't know what boo means. He doesn't know anything what it means. He, can, he has the power to repeat what you say. And you're right. There are people in this world who go around like tukis, boo. Whatever, they, you know, they hear someone say this, they say that. That's not called conversation. We're speaking midaber means the power, I said it from the beginning, the power to discuss, to develop an idea, and to say it over. That's only man has. So man is called a midaber. He's not just like any other animal which lives. He has the power of speech. And this puts him on the highest plane. That he has intellect and speech. Communication. That means he can understand things and he can communicate them and say them over. So, that, so obviously man, even if we're not going to speak now anything deeper, Kabbalistic, or anything like that, just on a very physical plane, simple. Domain, we understand that man is on a much higher level than anything else created. So it certainly is not appropriate that a human being who has this, this uh, power of understanding and communication will, then, will live the life of an animal. True, the physical side, he's equal to an animal. But already, mentally, and uh, with the power of speech, is on a different plane. Now all this is even if we didn't have this spiritual soul which Hashem blew into us. The moment Hashem gave us spirituality and, and gave us the opportunity to link ourselves to spirituality and, and to God. So again, we're on a much, 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 much higher level. Now we're not just, you know, uh, someone who has a brain and can invent things and create cures or scientific uh, inventions, high tech, and also communicate them and teach them. Now it's something on a different level. You can, you can, you can be spiritual. You can uh, make spiritual connections. You can use spirituality to come closer to Hashem. But spirituality has to be developed. Like anything else, if you want to be a scientist or a doctor or whatever you want to be, 
It's not that you're just going to sit back and lie on the beach and you're going to be a great professor. Of course not. You have to work and study. If you want to have a connection to spirituality, you have to work on spirituality. But there's a problem. Half of us is physical. And we are, our first tendency is towards physicality. The biggest professor and the biggest rabbi, if he's hungry, it's over. His mind is on, he's hungry. He wants something to eat. So he doesn't function. So he has the potential, but he has to be physically comfortable. If he's sick, forget about it. He, he can't function because physically he's not well. So we have to have our physical side in tune, healthy, strong, and then to know that the spiritual side of us is the real important side. That's, the highest, that's, the, that's our highest level. It's like someone who has, you know, he owns many things. He's got properties, he's got businesses, lots of money in the bank, okay. But he has a crown jewel, which was in the crown of some of the great monarchs of the world, and he bought it. And this jewel is priceless. You can't buy it with money. And no one in the world has such a crown jewel. So that's our soul. That's above and beyond anything else we have. We have many assets, but our soul is the main asset. But if we, unfortunately, many people live only the physical life, they go through life just uh, thinking, you know, they want to dress nicely because that clothes are physical, they co it covers their body. They want, to, they want to look good, they want to eat good and enjoy eating. There's, a, there's an art of eating also. They want to eat well in the nice places with beautiful surroundings, everything. I go for holidays to the Riviera, to wherever, nice, beautiful places in the world. But what about the nishama? What about the soul? Which is the, our main essence is our soul. What are we doing for the soul? I mean, could we imagine someone taking care of, you know, let's say like today we're in a situation where they have all these refugees leaving the, the Arab countries and going to Europe and all over the world. So let's say someone decides he wants to help the refugees. But his own children and his wife are neglected. They're living like they're starving to death. He doesn't take care of them. That's wrong. I mean, everyone agrees charity begins at home. First, be charitable in your home. Be kind to your wife and, and children. Then take it further. Of course, you have to take it further. But you don't start internationally and your home is neglected. The same thing here. If, if people are taking care of their physical side, and not thinking of their spiritual side, which is their main essence. Really what life is about is our spirituality. But, but the Nishama also grow in the physical life. Even if you go to a, to a shape or to a, to a motorcycle, you can get the, the light of the Creator in the, in the motorcycle. You can get the light of the Creator in the, in the gym. You can get the light of the Creator in the Okay, the I agree program. with you. Every I agree with you, but you have to be, I agree with you. Hashem is everywhere. You're right. But you have to train yourself to get to that level when you think of spirituality. If you live a physical life and a life of sin and indulgement and say, oh, everything is spiritual, you know, I have a Muslim girlfriend, unbelievable. When I'm with her, I feel I'm with, uh, with Hashem and with God. You know, your imagination can let you astray to think, wow, you know, I'm so spiritual. The truth is, our friend who's asking this question is an Israeli. And with no offense meant, there's a big problem for, for, for Israelis. I have this big question to ask. So many young Israelis, after the army, go to the Far East, trekking the Far East. There are places in Tibet, in China, where they have say it says uh, grocery, it says it in Tamil, and it says it in Hebrew. It doesn't say it in English, it doesn't say it in French, it doesn't say it in Latin, it doesn't say it in any language. 
Hebrew. Why? Because the, the, the quantity of Israelis trekking the Far East is unbelievable. When the tsunami happened 10 years ago, the, there was a lot of uh, talk about the numbers. They were worried. We don't know. The first day, the second day, we don't know how many people. Maybe people lo lost their lives. So they, they said very clearly, there's between, very vague, but there's between 300,000 to 400,000 Israelis roaming the Far East and all the different countries. I ask a question. Why don't you find, you know, if we have 300,000 Israelis continuously roaming the Far East, why don't we find uh, 1,000 Englishmen or, or 500 Frenchmen you know, who would roam the Far East? There isn't. There isn't. What happened? The soul of a Jew is spiritual. When Jews, like what happened here, they were uprooted from spirituality and they were taught a very, very secular way of life. They were cut off from their Jewish roots. Now inside, they're suffering. They're thirsty. They're lacking. So, so someone's going to tell them, yeah, but Judaism is all about spirituality. Okay, let me see it. So they go to uh, say a yeshiva. What, what is, what's happening here? There's a question and answer, discussion and argument. and It's all very dry. No, we want the real thing. We want spirituality. So they go to the Far East and you have pop spirituality. Like today in Hollywood, you have pop Kabbalah. So also you can have gurus. I know from people who've been there and been through the whole system and got all the way to the top and believed in it, but then found out it's all fake. It's all fake. Or it's, as the Zohar says, if you want to connect to the, to the occult, to the forces of impurity, the forces of magic, black magic, it's very easy. With a clip of the finger, you're there. So people go to the Far East, they meet the Guru, they zoom in. Yeah, they see, they see the spirits, they see everything, you know. Okay, then sometimes they come back to Israel and they, okay, I want to see Yeshiva. They get very, uh, very, uh, they lose all the inspiration. They're not inspired. What's the question, answer, argument? What's going on here? They don't see the spirituality. But the Zohar says, true spirituality we have to work for. Pop spirituality is there for the taking. Just the opposite. If it comes easy, you know it's fake. If you have to work for it, then you know it's the real thing. You know, you can have today uh, costume jewelry. Uh, you buy your wife a diamond necklace, diamond like in inverted commas. Uh, unbelievable. The Queen of England doesn't have such. But it's costume jewelry, it's a, a bits of glass, nothing. But you get her the real thing, a real diamond jewelry, even one diamond, which is worth a lot. It's different level altogether. So we have to know there's a lot of the fake and little of the true. We have to look for the truth. And looking for the truth is not easy. So let's come to the, you know, to the point. We have freedom of choice. Every, every step in life is a decision which is really a crossroads. To the right or to the left. You know, to the keeper or to the bare head. To the... The good or the bad. It's, it's a, people don't realize it, that it's a, it's a crossroads. Sometimes you think, oh, it's a very small decision, you know. But they don't realize the, the repercussions and, and what, could, what could happen from such a decision. Anyone who wants to be connected and they come to this, uh, you know, this community and are connected to the rabbis. So that is a positive statement. You're connected to good. And this will bring lots of good. And even if you have other connections, slowly the trend will be towards goodness and spirituality. And if you get to a very high spiritual level after maybe, maybe 30 years of learning Kabbalah and, uh, and serving Hashem with all the mitzvot in, and working on your character traits, which is the most important thing, the Torah makes demands of us to have good character traits, to be accommodating, to be kind, to be charitable, to feel for others, to take others into consideration. That's all what the Torah is about. The Vilna Gaon once said, if not to perfect my personality and my character traits, why am I in the world? 
It's not here, we're not here to put on the best, the most expensive pair of fili, you know, wonderful, shining tzitzi. That's not it's what it's about. After all of that, did you change as a human being? Did you become correct in your behavior traits? So here we are on the doorstep of Rosh Hashanah. The significance of Rosh Hashanah is the shofar. Everyone knows. What's Rosh Hashanah? We blow the shofar. What does this signify? It's a loud wailing voice, but it's a voice of crying. Their soul is awakened, and they start thinking, Rosh Hashanah, I have to improve. I have to do something in the right direction. So that's the simple meaning of what the shofar is about. But if we try to look into it a little more, we'll see that the shofar is a as a hollow horn of, a, let's say, a cow. It's hollow. Hmm? A ram. It's something, you know, a hell. It's a shell. It's a shell. Hollow shell. That's what's left of it. When you take out the inside, what you left? You have a, a shell, which is the shofar. And how do you make the shofar cry? You blow into it. What significance is there in our blowing into the shofar? The significance is, on this day, Hashem created man and he blew into him the spirit of life. Man is like the shell. He's hollow. He's nothing. On his own, you put the shofar on the table. It doesn't, it doesn't make any noise and it won't wake anybody up. You can carry on sleeping. It doesn't change anything and anyone. Blow into it from within yourself, from your Jewish soul, which is within you, which is divine, and it will start crying. And this is the whole idea of Rosh Hashanah, to become aware of what we are. Hashem created us and blew into us the spirit of life and made us a living, a spiritual being who can do great things, who has control over the world. You know what? I see the Mikubalim here, who learned for six years. The Mikubalim say, we have control over Hashem as well. Hashem created the world in such a way that he put us in the driving seat. He gave us the steering wheel, the brakes, the clutch, and the accelerator. And Hashem is there with us. We're taking him along for a drive. God forbid we have an accident, it's not so nice. We have Hashem with us. We're in control. Hashem will relate to us how we relate to him. We are the ones who open up the divine channels. Hashem wants to give us unendingly with no limitations. But to be able to receive unendingly, so we have to do the right things which, which cause this divine bounty to come down in gigantic quantities of spirituality. So we run the world. Hashem is created in that way, for good or for bad. If we sin, we literally, it says, someone who sins pushes away divine, the divine presence. Because Hashem says, a proud person, I can't live in the same world as him. I move away. He needs all the room. He needs everything. And even FC odd, he fills up the world. <laughs> no room for Hashem. We have to live humble lives, know our limitations, and use our spirituality to connect to Hashem. And that's the message of Rosh Hashanah. When you hear the shofar, remember, from where is this wailing sound coming? From your soul, which is going into it with your breath. Just like when Hashem blew into Adam Rishon. The Jewish soul has many levels. The Zohar says, Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Haya, Yehida, five levels. And they, they correspond to how we do a mitzvah. Among them, mitzvah tiki at shofar. We have the actual physical doing of the mitzvah, which is nefesh. We learn the halachot, and we say the pasuk when we blow the shofar. We read, butkatem the shofar, yom teruahi lachem. That's already the boot. That's that we connect the speech and the Torah to our mitzvah. Then kavanah, you have to have intention when you do a mitzvah that you're fulfilling the mitzvah to fulfill your obligation. 
That's kavana. Then machshava. You have to think about the mitzvah while you're doing it. If you know the reasons behind the mitzvah, think about them. Think about what the mitzvah is achieving. Mitzvahs are not just dry actions. They achieve something. They do great things in the world. That's machshava. And finally, the highest level is yehida. The highest level of the Jewish soul, which is simcha, happiness. We're meant to do, we're meant to serve Hashem with happiness. And all this is going into the, when, we, when the tokea blows the shofar, and you hear this crying sound, we have to remember Hashem is reminding us, today I created man. I made him a being who has freedom of choice. He can go after spirituality and be connected to God and achieve wonderful things in the world. Or he can go after physicality and, and live a life like, you know, like we said, like a hippopotamus or an alligator and enjoy life. So we have that option. But as human beings and as Jews who have this nishmat Israel, which is helek eloka memar, which is divine, we have to make the right decision and follow in the ways of spirituality. That's the message of Rosh Hashanah. How do we improve? We start living more spiritual lives. We, we neglect a little bit physical comforts and, you know, all sorts of uh, tendencies that human beings have to be very, 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 very physical. And we live lives of spirituality. But I must say, and this is very important, our religion is different from all other religions. Many other religions, there is no way to, to combine the physical with the spiritual. So let's say priests, they have to be celibate. What's it called? Celibate. Hmm? Celibate. celibate. They can't marry. <laughs> Nuns, celibate. They can't marry. Uh, forget about the Far East, the sadhus, the gurus. They, they, don't, they don't eat. Uh, they don't, you know, they don't get married. They all... Why? Because they, they, their way of thinking is... You can't be at once physical and spiritual. You want to be spiritual? Cut out physicality from your life. But the Jewish religion is just the opposite. The Torah teaches us to sanctify the physical, to make your body holy by putting on tefillin and tzitzit and having a kippah on your head. You make your, when you do mitzvot with your body, you're, making, you're sanctifying your body. We have 248 positive commandments corresponding to 248 limbs in the, Jew, in the body. We have 365 negative commandments corresponding to 365 sinews of the body. Every mitzvah that we do, positive or negative, brings perfection to one of our limbs. And that's why when we say a bracha before doing a mitzvah, the bracha is, Asher kideshanu b'mitzvotav, who has sanctified us and made us holy through the mitzvot. Every mitzvah we do brings holiness into one of our limbs, one of our sinews, as we do it. So this is what it means. Our, our lives are, are spiritual, but everything is connected to physicality. Jews must get married. There are many singles here. We're going to give you all a bracha this year. There's not a shame. We have to get married. Eating on Shabbat is a mitzvah, even on a weekday, whatever you need, you should eat. But on Shabbat, it's even to the extent that the rabbis say you should eat more than you need. Enjoy it, because makarat al Shabbat only. Uh, functioning as a husband, as a wife, a couple are meant to be happy together, make each other happy, fulfill the wishes and desires of one another. We encourage that. That's how it's meant to be. But the ultimate purpose is not just to take for my fulfillment and my enjoyment. The ultimate purpose is giving, and beyond that, to realize that we are created in the image of God, and everything we do is holy. And it's holy spiritually and physically. So our work in life is to connect to spirituality, and then, and then to sanctify the physical world. That's why we know, Eris Israel, you're here, you met living here is a holy land because it has spirituality. A relationship of a husband and wife. Marriage is spiritual, more than it's physical. People have to know that. They're not marrying a, a chunk of flesh. They're marrying a spiritual being with a soul which, which, which wants to attain perfection through marriage. Marriage puts teams together, a soul which was once together in the higher worlds. 
The Zohar says when they come down, they split and they come down. When they meet their soulmates, they're uniting a soul and they're achieving perfection. So of course, we are, we are spiritual, we are physical, and we have to serve Hashem with our bodies as well, doing the right thing, but always giving preference to our spiritual side and not neglecting it as most people do, unfortunately. We have to make, put the accent on the right thing to know, yes, we're physical, we're here to have a lovely time in this world, and we should be happy in every way. But the main thing is our connection with God. And this is the concept of Rosh Hashanah, when we hear the, the wails of the shofar, too, too. We should feel that these, that with the voice, with the air, the breath of the one blowing the shofar, Hashem's breath is coming into the whole of creation and filling up the whole world with spirituality for the new year. We're getting a, a rejuvenation. We're getting our batteries retoned, regenerated with spirituality, which Hashem is bringing into the world, especially on Rosh Hashanah, for us to enjoy and to link up to and live our lives as Jews. Now, I want to give you all a blessing, everybody. And uh, with that Hashem, if you all uh, want to be in touch in the future, we have here our very special rabbis. You can tell them, and if they... If they want, from time to time, we'll find the opportunities and come and maybe speak more specifically. Maybe we can answer questions and whatever. We'll try our best to, to be part of the community here and to help people get closer to Hashem. We're blessing everybody and all we call Am Israel. Shashem Yashpia Lanu Bracha Ad Beli Dai. Vita Beli Benu Ahavata Torah Virat Shamaim. Is a Keo Tanu. Lechet Bederecha Torah. Lekaim Amitzvot. Liot Smehim. Mutzlahim and Burachim. Shashem Yerapeo Tanu. Refuat Shalema. Refuat and Nefesh. Refuat and Goof. Vyashpia Lanu Brachot Vihatzlahon. Panasa Beshefa Ubenahat. Vizake. It called a Biltinisuin Adain. Yair it Mazalam, where's Minlahem, it Benezugehem, השם יברך אתכם, יצליח אתכם, תזכו ללמוד, ללמד, לשמור, לעשות, אמן, כן, יהי רצון. I don't have to translate it. Okay. Good wishes and tidings are understood in all languages.